Hello and welcome to episode number 23 of Performing Labor. My name is Rob Simons, and I am your host. This podcast features interviews with accomplished performing musicians who are doing interesting and creative work from within performing arts institutions and outside of them. We'll impact their training, their practice, and their careers, how they got started, how they stay sharp, and their ambitions for the future. And it's my hope that these interviews will provide value no matter where you are on your musical journey. If you are thinking about a career in music, if you are in music school now, a working musician, or if you're a music lover and just curious to learn more. My guest this week is Sarah Whitney, violinist in the critically acclaimed string quintet, Sybarite Five. And she's the founder of the concert series, Beyond the Notes, and her musician's coaching practice and blog, The Productive Musician. Sarah's a fellow native of Massachusetts, and she's a graduate of the University of Michigan and the Cleveland Institute of Music. The Washington Post has remarked on her marvelous violin acrobatics and wrote with great optimism about the genuine spontaneous excitement that Sybarite Five elicited from their audience, an observable departure from the routine chamber music experience. And that pursuit of genuine connection with audiences and with fellow musicians seems to be at the heart of Sarah's ethos and the story of how she and the group first connected with that spirit, and maybe more importantly, how they reconnect with it and have sustained it over more than a decade of touring and recording is a great object lesson for young and mid-career professionals. We in this profession, I think, know instinctively that joy, and as the Post said, genuine and spontaneous excitement should be our obvious goals. But the reality is the professional path that leads through music school, through competitions and auditions, through good and bad reviews can lead us astray. So I think that it's exciting that in this new phase of her career, Sarah is putting her experience and her vision in service of other musicians to help them interpret and navigate new ways to think about their practice and unlock hidden potential, or perhaps more accurately, suppressed potential, leading to more creative, happier, fulfilling, and secure careers. I've spent the vast majority of my career happily in large institutions, and I've also drawn immeasurable inspiration from the great work done by the cohort of performers and ensembles that were and are held up as emblematic successes for entrepreneurship in classical music. But I also think that there is an inherent tension between institutional music making and pure entrepreneurship. And as that term became a buzzword for performing arts organizations and academia, I think those that often distrusted it were people like me, institutionalists that had actual experience producing concerts, tours, and recordings outside the walls of our orchestras or colleges. The Harvard Business School defines entrepreneurship as, quote, the relentless pursuit of opportunity beyond the resources currently controlled. And the HBS faculty member, Thomas R. Eisenman, expands on that further and I think reinforces what Sarah describes about her trajectory. Pursuit, he writes, implies a singular, relentless focus. Entrepreneurs often perceive a short window of opportunity. They need to show tangible process. Opportunity may entail pioneering a truly innovative product, devising a new business model, or targeting an existing product to a new set of customers. And finally, beyond resources controlled, implies resource constraints. At a new venture's outset, its founders control only their human, social, and financial capital. But I think it's worth noting that Harvard College was founded in 1636, and Harvard Business School was founded 273 years later, amidst a fair amount of controversy and resistance, and its campus is literally tucked away in another city. The friction between institutional thinking and entrepreneurship is not merely ideological, it is to a degree foundational. In his 2016 PhD dissertation, the musicologist William Robin wrote, quote, the rhetorical positioning of indie classical, that it came into existence outside the strictures of the concert hall and the academy, may create the false impression that the next generation could thrive without the traditional infrastructure of classical and new music. It is troubling, then, 
that the supposed entrepreneurialism of indie classical is presented as a solution to classical music's economic woes. Close quote. The key word for me in that passage is solution. When success hinges on mutual solutions, the dissonance becomes unresolvable and perhaps obscures the real opportunities for growth. As I mentioned in this interview, and discussed more in depth in the episodes with Teddy Abrams and Lisa Brooks, the direction of many large institutions is to take on more of a service element and a community building role, something more of a public good. In other words, something even less tied to the churning marketplace. But what that community-based or service-driven vision needs is more creative, confident, and fearless performers. Performers comfortable in different roles and with a problem-solving mindset, the kind that Sarah is helping to cultivate. And I'd encourage anyone looking to unlock more of their potential as a performer or problem solver to engage with her work, her ideas, and to connect with her directly. And the ways to do that are mentioned in the interview and the links are available in the show notes. Please enjoy this interview with Sarah Whitney. Sarah Whitney, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. So I recently gave a roundtable conversation talk with some kids from the Eastman School of Music about audition strategy. And given the circumstances that we're all in, the conversation drifted from auditions to career counseling of some sort. And in those conversations about other ways to make a living, uh, what is possible, you and your group came up in the conversation a couple of times. So that hastened me to ask you <laughs> to come on the show. And so you guys have been out there touring and recording for many years and have certainly earned your foothold in the industry. So I'm curious how you guys weathered this hiatus and how are you poised to come out of this once it's safe for us to all gather together again? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, of course, you know, the music industry has been hit hard along with, you know, all, so many industries. But, you know, I think one thing that Sybarite is really good at is being innovative and doing things creatively. So, you know, what we have done is we have a couple projects in the works that we've been doing and we brainstormed on, you know, sort of in the immediate time of COVID, which obviously we're still, you know, social distancing is still in that, but, um, we started brainstorming about what could we bring our audiences in this time when we can't do live concerts the five of us couldn't even really be in the same room you know mm -hmm. there was a time where that was sort of questionable and um, we weren't sure about that but we created a series called uh, cocktails and composers which was basically us bringing in composers we'd work with having conversations with the ensemble engaging our audience in a way um, because one thing that we've found in our ensemble is that people really like unique experiences. So we're like, well, what can we do? Cocktails composers, we'll make a cocktail. We'll have a professional, we had a professional um, bartender on the show who, who helped us with that. I guess to your question, you know, how are we going to come out of this and how are we weathering the storm? I think it's a time when all artists really have to tap into their creativity more than ever when it comes to how can we deliver things differently? How can we still connect with audiences? Maybe not in the traditional way that we are used to. And whether that's obviously virtually as an option, socially distanced concerts, um, unique ways. I mean, the cocktails and composers, we didn't even, we didn't play live. It was just a way for people to stay engaged, keep the conversations about music going. As we come out of it, I think there's still a lot of unknowns and it's really hard to know what is the future looks like in the next few months. We're hopeful, obviously, for things getting back to normal as soon as possible, whenever that is. When we do come back, do you think any of this will stick? Do you think that this these online offerings you have will continue? Yeah, you know, I have thought a lot about this, and I do. I really do. I think that there are actually a lot of benefits to what can be done virtually. and. I think it's quite amazing. Obviously the reach of what you can do is different than what you can do in a concert hall um, and what you can do with technology. And I've done some really creative things with my concert series to really actually take advantage of the online platform and do things that couldn't be done in the live concert setting. That being said, I'm not saying it replaces mm -hmm. the live concert, but I do think that it's really 
you know, people have created some really amazing things and you can create community in that way. It's like I said, it's different than the live community, but I really do think some of these, these things are going to stick around and it's just giving us more avenues to communicate with music or with artists. Um, and I think that's a really incredible thing. You guys are real road warriors in the, in the normal times, right? So you're really out there playing a lot of shows. Were you finding that you were able to connect with the folks that were in Tulsa or Texas or California? Yeah, definitely. I mean, some of the the events we've done, we also did a virtual fundraiser and we've done a few live stream shows. Um, actually, uh, we have some stuff coming up um, at the end of the month that we're doing. Absolutely. I think um, we're, oh, we've always been very connected with our audience. And that's something that, you know, so on these events and the Zoom events, we have people from all over and really have connected with our audiences and, um, you know, however we could do safely, obviously. So when you guys started out, and I've heard you talk about how you moved with the promise of a great artistic experience, but with a very limited, if any, financial expectations. Mm -hmm. And so as you were forming this group, did you guys have a sense of, of a shared vision for it? Or was it or did it evolve? So in other words, you know, speaking of orchestra, you know, I've heard you say that you weren't interested in playing an orchestra early on, but were you also not necessarily interested in playing just standard repertoire in any format? Were you interested in, a, in, ex, in an experimental group from the start? You know, looking back, I can say yes. I'm not sure I exactly knew that at the mm -hmm. time, but you know, through my training, I'm obviously, I'm a classically trained violinist. I went to University of Michigan and CIM and did a, sort of a standard trajectory for violin performance. But um, I was always exploring different genres and sort of pushing the envelope with what I could pull off in my classical violin performance degree. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I grew up doing a lot of bluegrass fiddle music. And then in college, I started exploring jazz and I learned how to improvise. And then at CIM, I sort of just had this like hunger to explore other things. I was constantly, I remember I'd go to the CIM library and I'd like flip through, I'd try to find like weird kind of unique music. I was always looking for unique things. And, and I say, I guess, unique and accessible. I wasn't really after like the crazy, crazy new music stuff. Um, and I did plenty of that and I, it was great, but I was sort of after the accessible kind of off the beaten path. I did a lot of Piazzolla. I did some Claude Bowling, um, a piece with drum set. I did, um, I actually performed some of my own jazz tunes on a, on a recital that I did. Um, so I was always sort of like, doing a lot of different things. And then I would always play some standard classical too. I still love that and still play that. So I think when I met Sybarite at the Aspen, at Aspen, the Aspen Music Festival, and the, there's like just a tiny backstory on Sybarite is that we started playing outside on a street corner in Aspen. And Lewis, the founder of the group, started the, the quintet actually years before I was involved when he was a student in Aspen, just as like a fun, Let's just busk on the street. Everybody busks in Aspen. You open your case. You hope people throw in money. And so he had started this because he was a bass player. There wasn't many opportunities for bass players to play chamber music. So he sort of had to create it. And that's how Sybarite started. And then over the years, he found a very famous street corner and was able to get the businesses there to sponsor free concerts um, a couple times a week. So it was sort of a gig. And that's when I sort of met Lewis and was introduced to Sybarite. And... The reason why I'm bringing this up as far as the eclectic uh, repertoire we play is because when you're outside, right, and you're playing to people that are on the street or walking by, you can very quickly recognize if they like something or not, because mm -hmm. if they like it, they'll stay. If they don't, they'll walk away. Mm -hmm. And so I think we were able to really see what drew people in. You know, the repertoire, like I said, we didn't have a, a library of repertoire to choose from. So it was sort of like grabbing things from different string orchestra arrangements. What can we get? OK, we got oh, I, I got a Disney arrangement. OK. Oh, we got some rock and roll. We got some Stairway to Heaven. Oh, we got Brandenburg. We got. So it was sort of like we were just at the very beginning. I mean, especially even before I, I was involved, it was like just whatever we could get. Mm -hmm. And as we played this, we sort of started to realize that the eclectic mix worked really well and we could see what people really liked. And that was sort of the beginning of the eclectic programming that Sybarite still does. That's where it came from. Yeah, you know, there's the idea that startups should be lean and agnostic about what they're doing, right? That there should be no real plan because it means if, you're, if, you're, if you've got a plan that you stick to, you're not listening. 
You're not iterating, you're not changing based on the circumstances. So obviously in the DNA of the group and the skeleton of the group is this experimenting and also, as you said, accessibility. Leading up to your competition success though, was there like a shared um, visioning for the group? I mean, did you, because on one hand, winning a big competition that launches your career is actually a pretty traditional way of going about things. But on the other hand, you guys did it in a kind of untraditional way. So I'm curious about how all that took shape as you went into that funnel. Yeah, you know, before we won CAG, we actually were pretty branded. I mean, in a sense that we, the eclectic repertoire had always been a piece of who we were. And actually, I, I pause. I think we there was a point where we played Dvorak Quintet because it was sort of like a necessity of like, we need music to play on concert stage. And we did play that for a little while. And, um, but we knew that that wasn't our mission. You know, our mission was not to recreate the big, great mm -hmm. classical standard pieces. So we were, you know, very much in agreement and we were branded sort of as a group who did different genres, we did different things. We didn't, and actually we didn't dress traditionally either. Mm -hmm. We did not show up on the concert stage in tuxedos and gowns. And actually we worked with someone, um, I don't remember what her title was, but she worked on our image. She worked on our brand with us actually before we won CAG and basically wanted to brand us as a band sort of, you know, and that is sort of how our programming works as well. We have like our greatest hits, you know, pieces that our audiences love and go crazy over that we will play all the time. Mm -hmm. And then we intersperse the new stuff in there and we still do that with our programming. So that's sort of like a band, you know, we don't have an entirely new repertoire of music every single season. Mm -hmm. And then also how we dress. She sort of wanted to brand us as something that was more accessible. Um, we talk about our wardrobe as what would you wear on a first date? <laughs> something that's not trying too hard, but polished. <laughs> um, and so we did have that before CAG. We had definitely had some focus in that area. When you guys started shopping this product out to presenters, was there any kind, were you kind of caught in some kind of middle space? Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I think back then, I mean, that was, gosh, over 10 years ago, but I think there some presenters didn't know what to do with us mm -hmm. because there was a time where they'd say, well, you don't fit on our classical series because you're not playing the standard classical music, but you don't really fit on our, quote, alternative series or whatever that is. Um, so absolutely. And there was presenters that really would say, well, I'll hire you if you play the Dvorak Quintet. <laughs> and, you know, for a while we did and, mm -hmm. you know, we needed concerts, but actually it was after CAG that we started becoming much more adamant about saying, you know what, that's not our mission. And if someone wants us to do that, then we're not the right fit for them. Um, but absolutely, we were sort of, I think people didn't really know what to do with us. And then there was a time, I mean, as more groups like us and more experimental groups, um, Obviously, there's many more groups more similar to us now. I think we've found our place like sometimes we're the wild card on the classical series or we are the conservative classical offering on a like a more alternative series. So yeah. give me an example of a more alternative series that you guys get booked on. Yeah. So we I mean, we've been booked on series at big theaters that do like that will book bands and they might have a dance troupe come in. They might have like a folk group. Um, they might have like, I'm trying to think like maybe, yeah. So that kind of thing. Like it's, so it's, it's really, you know, we're the classical offering on a series for something like that. When you do something like that, are you guys amplified? Um, no, rarely do we play amplified. We'll only play amplified if it's necessary for the, the size of the room. Mm -hmm. Do you think when you've played, um, the, the, when you're the wild card on the classical set, do you think sometimes the presenters have a, are they taking an accurate temperature of their audience in the sense that, cause I've, you know, I've shopped around a, a solo recital for years and years I did and often had a really hard time getting through the door because it was almost all contemporary music or, or contemporary and folk music or something. And it just, it, I understand that it didn't hold together on paper very well, but I was convinced it would hold together for audiences. And it, I think I was proven right more often than not. So did you guys have that experience where there was um, a presenter that was resistant and then the audience was just like blown away and they and they kind of missed, missed that cue? Oh yes, oh, so many. I mean, we had, no, like, we also don't, use a printed program. So when a series says, hey, send us your program, we're like, great, 
works announced from stage. And that would cause presenters to have such anxiety. I mean, I can't tell you like how many presenters would like write our managers and our manager would be like, so they really want something. Like, can you give them anything? <laughs> they don't know what to tell their audience. Like, oh, so many, so many. And I would say that 99% of the time we go in there, we do our show, we would kill it and people would love it. And they'd be like, I've never seen anything like this before. And the presenter would be thrilled. And it's, you know, so yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> And that kind of probably gave you like carte blanche when you came back to that series 24 months later or something like that. Yeah. I mean, you know, and presenters talk to all the presenters talk to each other and it's always like people asking for recommendations. So I think, you know, people started to talk and realize that we weren't as scary as we seemed like with, you know, composers that no one recognized and um, us saying we won't give you a program. You know, those were things that really stressed a lot of presenters out for sure. How much of your show involves improvisation? Um, not all that much of it, to be honest. Um, we have certain pieces that have elements of improvisation, um, but most of it is is written out. So where do you get to flex that muscle, your improvisation muscle? Well, I do get to flex that muscle. So there's a couple pieces that have been written with specific sections for me to take a solo. Um, sometimes, um, you know, I'm the main improviser in the group. Others do at mm -hmm. different levels. And, and the more and, and people in the, in the group are starting to improvise more and more. But for a long time, I was really the only one who was comfortable doing that. So if we got an arrangement or a piece, like sometimes the arranger or composer would want to know that and they would sort of write something in specifically for me. Given the, the nature of your music, did you did you guys have when you're coming up, did you have mentors and role models? You know, yeah, when we started there weren't a lot of other groups doing things like we were doing. There was time for three. Mm -hmm. So they were definitely a group that we were inspired by because they started before we did, I think. Um, I mean, there was eighth Blackbird, which was not really so, like some similarities, you know, but no, there weren't a lot of groups doing what we were doing. Yeah. I had Matt Albert on this show um, oh, a while back and he was talking about how intentional they were at the beginning about how they wanted to look and the presenting. And they actually kind of got out of some of the harder conversations with presenters because their percussion needs were so specific um, that they could only go down the road with certain gear. And like that was his own constraint that I thought was interesting. So the live show that they could kind of dictate the game a little bit more. Yeah. So you guys released a live album during the hiatus here. Obviously that was in the works before this all happened. But tell me about how that came about. Why why do a live album, it's kind of a, a unique thing for classical groups and, and how's that going? Yeah, so yeah, we did. We released an album in May um, called Live from New York. It's Sybarite 5. And um, yeah, so in New York, we have a residency at this place called the Cell Theater, which has been our home in New York for many, many years. I mean, I think we've had a residency there for eight or nine years. Um, and we play there a couple times in the season. And, uh, and so we just, we had this idea. I mean, we, and that's sort of like our test kitchen. We do like wacky things there. We do some collaborations there. It's sort of like a really fun place for us. So we had this idea we could record all those shows in sort of like the venue that was so instrumental in like our success in New York and giving us a place to experiment and create things. Um, so that's what we did. We recorded all the shows and, um, yeah, that's how that came about. Do you feel that as a product, it captures you guys better? In other words, people probably know you best as a live act. And so for the folks that are going to buy your record, do you think that they take home something that's more authentic in, in a live record than they do in a studio one? You know, I think the energy might be a little different. You know, I think it's different. I, I wouldn't say it's more authentic, it's less authentic. I think it's just a different experience when you're li listening to a live show. Um, but yeah, the energy is definitely, um, I would say different. And yeah, it's a, great, it's a great record. I really enjoyed listening to it from top to bottom. And uh, it struck me though, that so much of my listening, I hadn't really put this together until, <laughs> until I was thinking about this, that so much of my listening is informed by the medium. So I listen to a lot of music on YouTube. And I listen to a lot of the versions of the songs or whatever I'm listening to, I tend to gravitate towards the live ones, where I would have thought of the record, the studio record as being like the document version of these things that I as a listener, even as a pro, um, are drawn like gravitationally to the, to the live recordings. And I found that interesting, because I guess I don't really hear too many live 
um, with production records like you guys put out. So thinking about the going forward, you've recently left New York City. What is the benefit then as a, so obviously you guys had rehearsed and all that, but you're mainly a touring group. And so what is the benefit for a young musician being in New York City if you're not a part of an established group like you are? Oh, there's so many benefits to being in New York City. I mean, I can really only speak to the main benefits pre-COVID, mm -hmm. obviously. I want to hear about that, though. Yeah, I think New York is just a place where there is so much happening. I think that the innovation, the creativity, um, the inspiration, the people you meet, I think it's just such an incredible place to to be and, and, and just explore. I think um, New York is the place where you can try anything. And I think that that is just a really incredible thing that New York has to offer. And also, you know, collaborations with other artists. I mean, high level artists mm -hmm. of all different kinds, obviously. And, and it also, you know, you can see all these amazing things happening. I mean, there is a bazillion venues having, having shows every single night of different things. You know, it's just sort of a place where people are being so creative and fearless and doing things that aren't being done anywhere else. Moving there, was that some, some kind of a finishing school for you, like being able to be around all those people? You know, it's interesting. My move to New York was actually not something that I could have predicted. I didn't like, I didn't grow up thinking, oh, I want to live in New York City or even in school. I wasn't like, yeah, I'm going to move to New York. I actually really didn't think that at all. And to be completely honest, I only went to New York twice before I moved there. I never went to the city. And so the few times I'd gone there, I was like, oh, this place is amazing, but so overwhelming, like, ah, no way. And um, but when I got the call from Lewis and Sybarite Five asking me if I was interested in moving to New York to build up the group, it really made a lot of sense because mm -hmm. I met them at Aspen and I would realized I didn't want to be in an orchestra. Um, so it sort of happened organically. But um, but yeah, I, I think it was, you know, and I think that's also now that I'm not there anymore, it sort of makes sense because I loved it there. It was I had an amazing time. I just think Manhattan is not I'm not a life. I'm not a Manhattan lifer like at all. So do you think that the things that drew you there and the things that well, maybe not super right, obviously, but the, the elements, the larger elements that drew you there? Do you think those things will return after the pandemic? Do you think those things will just will persist? Yeah, I do. I do think I do think they will. New York is an extremely resilient city mm -hmm. and people are so dedicated to well, people are dedicated to being there people are dedicated to keeping it alive you know when i've been back and i've been back to the city many times during the pandemic the energy is still there obviously things aren't happening the same way mm -hmm. but people are finding ways to make it happen you know the restaurants are building out these platforms and the roads and and you know musicians are doing things on their porch or presenting things in these you know so it's like People don't like New Yorkers aren't just going to sit back and say, ah, oh, COVID. Oh, well, you know, they're like, all right, like, <laughs> what can we do to make this work? You know, of course, it's challenging, but I really do think that it, it will bounce back. I mean, it'll take some time, <laughs> but I think that that New York is never going to lose lose that. During this, I had to go out to California for a little bit and going up there from sleepy Rochester <laughs> to Los Angeles and saying, oh, yeah, right, where there is a degree of activity in these large cities that is you can really forget about if you've if you've moved away from it. Yeah. And it is a I think it's a fairly resilient industry. I mean, the music industry. Um, what are your thoughts on what might change in terms of priorities in the music business uh, as we come back from this? Do you think that I mean, certainly the orchestra business is having we're having some really uh, hard internal conversations. I'm curious what your slice of the industry is talking about in terms of priorities coming back from this. I think that I've had a lot of conversations with musicians who have had some time and space or just clarity around things that are working in their lives, things that aren't working. And um, I think that's brought about some really interesting conversations and forced a lot of people to really get in touch with what really matters to them in their careers, in their lives. Are they creating the things they want to create? Are they doing the projects they want to do? Are they happy? You know, like I think in the swing of the crazy musician, busy life that so many of us lead, it's easy to, it's possible to lose sight of that. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, have you created a career that you just sort of feel like you should be, you should like it now because you created it? Or, 
you know, so I think there's been a, I've, I've been around a lot of uh, a lot of conversations happening around that and where our priorities, I think, in addition, also, it's like coming back to what's really important to the music. Like, why do we play? Like, you know, why do we play concerts? Why do we make music? Um, I think there's been a lot of that, too, sort of grounding musicians. And that's been really I mean, I think that's there's, there's been a lot of benefits to, to having those conversations and really getting true to, to what really matters and why we play music in the first place, you know? So in my part of the industry, you know, we have a lot of um, capacity, right? So we play a lot of concerts, you know, is six days a week work schedule with however many concerts a weekend over 40 some odd weeks a year. It adds up to a lot of activity. And I was recently introduced to this idea of scaling versus growth. Maybe mm -hmm. you've heard. So, right. So we have a lot of growth, right? So we pile, pile more concerts, more rehearsals, more repertoire. And to the point where we get this big, big, huge hulking season, which is a, an accomplishment in and of itself, right? The, the human, the human capacity it takes to pull off an orchestra season is enormous. But as we've gone from playing roughly 250 concerts a year to about three or four a month, <laughs> and those are all online now, yeah. um, it's it's been a time of repose and time to think about, I think exactly what you're saying and, and why we're doing that, what are we doing? So a lot of our conversations hover around a service element, right? So how can we inject more community service into uh, that work. And of course, on the surface, that sounds like a cliche, but once you start getting, once you start drilling down a little bit, you can get, you can get to something meaningful when in yourself and maybe perhaps in your peers, what is that, what kind of conclusions do you come to when you think about interrogating the why of the concerts? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. Well, from sort of a performance aspect, or I think, you know, musicians creating things that they want to create that are true to them and also really putting a priority on connection and community with the audience. I mean, I'll be real, you know, I think obviously in the, the classical world, in the music industry and in anything, you know, there's a lot of competition, there can be a lot of comparison, a lot of judgment, a lot mm -hmm. of like, why is he doing that? What, you know, I think, and I don't necessarily think that's going to disappear, but I think it's caused a lot of people to take a, you know, pause. And it's less like, oh, judge, like, you know, maybe the judgment is a little quieter. Or maybe we can kind of let some of that go and just say, well, okay, so maybe I'm not totally crazy about that project or the way that person's presenting themselves or the type of music they're playing. But can we all come back to why we do this? Can we all come back to, you know, connection, community, sharing something with people, expression? Um, yeah, so that's sort of what, what comes to mind, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, and that also sort of leads people to realize that maybe there are projects they want to do that they haven't and things they want to create and sort of opening a pathway where they can be more connected to the why. Some of the noises, the voices in our head, the self-doubts or all the comparison or the judgment or whatever. I mean, obviously that's still real. <laughs> and I mean, I, I work with people on that all the time, but I think that, you know, just connecting to that like why that piece why because that's what keeps us grounded you know that's what keeps us inspired that's what keeps us connected you know and ultimately if we can keep sight of our why and why something's important that's going to help us push through all the noise it's going to help us push through the resistance of you know how do i make it happen oh am i good enough all this stuff so i think it's so important to to be connected to that so you mentioned that you help people break through with this stuff. And I'm curious, though, do you find that the competition in our industry can be kind of become kind of a dulling force on musicians in the sense that, right, that it makes us that we end up mistaking the competition for the for the reason why we're there. And so it seems to me that you are a fairly unique individual in the industry and in that your group is so centered around the in, the audience experience and the audience's energy that you're more con, you're you, you have more experience being connected to that and is that something that your practice of helping in your your coaching is helping liberate classical musicians that probably aren't quite in touch with that I hope so you know I hope it is and I think you just made me think of something you said you know mistaking competition or something about mistaking competition for well we mistake the competition that's the thing that like that's the target not yeah. the audience 
Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, absolutely. And you also made me think of like, we sort of mistake the competition as gauging our success mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and, you know, sort of letting that be the driver or le letting that be what determines whether we're successful, whether we're good enough, whether we're doing the right things and also losing sight of why we're doing this in the first place. So I think, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, I, I don't, I don't think competition is bad necessarily. I think there's a lot of benefits to having, to having that in our world and obviously it's it's there but I, I i i agree with what you said you know it can sort of it can it can lead to you said the dulling like the, mm -hmm. i loved that word i think i i mean you know you were on zoom i shook my head fiercely when you said that <laughs> um because um yeah yeah absolutely so classical musicians are evaluated we're from a very young age we probably went through some of the similar institutions through our years and it seems like a steady stream of evaluations and that can become i think a burden it can kind of accumulate and is and is your coaching then part of like unlearning unlearning those things you know i'm not i'm not sure it's it's unlearning you know my coaching is really focused on helping people see possibility and creating what they want to create you know whether that whether something is being blocked because of experience with competition, maybe that's the case. And a lot of, like, I think, you know, it's such an interesting conversation to think about that. I think a lot of it does stem from that. But for me, you know, I think I'm really focused on helping people get through those blocks and whatever it may be, you know, that's my job as a coach to sort of be the detective and help people unlock those things that are holding them back so they can create the opportunities they want, you know, feel like, you know, really have more ease and excitement and opportunity and, and joy, honestly, in their career and what they're creating. I almost see it as kind of like continuing education. My, my wife, um, who's also a CIM grad, uh, she, <laughs> she had a wonderful gr top level violin career and she kind of just uh, let's say ran out of steam with it. Like the career didn't absorb her energy anymore. And so she's gone on to other uh, business ventures and been quite successful. One of the things that surprised me about watching her go through this transition, though, was in the business world, particularly in the entrepreneurial world, there are so many support networks. You know, there's so many opportunities for one-on-one -on -one, uh, learning and in group learning. And I almost wonder if that's like the missing piece in our education is this idea of continued learning. So do you almost see your practice as a, as a coach as sort of a continued learning for your, for your clients? Yes. I love that you said that. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I'm a lifelong learner. I think that, you know, what I hope to do is I want to create community around the things that I coach on. You know, I lead group programs. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching and I think, you're absolutely right. You know, support systems, you mentioned that you're in the business world that, you know, your wife has been a part of or is aware of. It's so important. I think that, you know, you look at the business world, people are constantly taking courses, learning new skills. It's, you know, it's sort of um, the support network is really strong. And obviously, I think as musicians, we are, we are, you know, primed to say, oh, I'll take some lessons. Okay, great. You know, I feel like that's something we all understand, but, but yeah, I think the continued learning is really important and also recognizing that we can change, right? We might change. We might be in college, think we want one thing, do one thing, and then want to do something else. And that's okay. I mean, people do that in all different types of careers all the time. Um, so yeah, I just, you know, I hope to create community around that and, and create a supportive environment where we can have real conversations about the challenges that musicians face and offer solutions and offer tools and really be focused on, you know, what do you want to create? What's most important to you? Mm -hmm. And then figure out what's missing between where you are now, where you want to be. And, you know, so that's really like the root of my work. Yeah, so many of the conversations I've had on this program and even the last one I had was, was with a dean of a music school. And there's this constant tension between uh, time or the lack of time and all these things we want to try. So if you're pursuing an orchestra career, four years, six years, probably really isn't enough time to get ready as it, from 18 to 24 or whatever it is um, for that, for that profession. Um, probably the same thing in sharing music. Like it just, you just need more time. And then to reform the curriculum is like turning around an ocean liner and because of the tradition and just institutional process is slow by almost by definition. 
But what are the things you think we could inject into perhaps an undergraduate curriculum or even a master's curriculum that might um, water these these seeds of of these of, of personal creativity? Because that seems to me the thing that our industry lacks, right? We, we, there's no lack of work ethic. There's no lack of technical training. There's none of that stuff is all fully formed, but what we do lack is, is sort of um, curiosity perhaps and self curiosity. Yes, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I think you're absolutely right. I think, um, you know, as, as in, as an undergrad, right, you're young, you're moldable, you're looking for guidance. And of course, like, that's necessary. You want people to tell you what to do. You want people to guide you. But I wish there was a more emph more emphasis on sort of how do you figure out what you want to do? You know, I think we land in, we live in a land of shoulds, right? Mm -hmm. Like you should do this. I mean, you should do this. You're a violinist. You should get an orchestra job because that's what violinists do. Or you should do this. I think that, um, you know, just conversations around this. Can we have conversations around this? Can we be real about all the pressure of the shoulds and at the end of the day, I think it's important pe for people to recognize that you may not be interested in what your classmates are interested in, and that's okay. You know, I think in my training, I mean, University of Michigan was um, a, a rel relatively liberal program, and there was a lot of resources for that. CIM was definitely more conservative. Mm -hmm. They're an incredible institution. They're an orchestral training school that does it so well. But, and I sort of had a knack for like, breaking down boundaries and doing things in a different way. And I know that that is unique. <laughs> like I mm -hmm. kind of had that in me, but you know, to have more resources for, for that and sort of, you know, show musicians, other things that are possible. I think bringing in more guests, having conversations about this, opening up the, you know, providing resources about how can you start to notice what inspires you? You know, how can you start to really be clear on that? How can we, can we have a conversation about the shoulds? Can we just talk about it? Can we just recognize that there's a lot of pressure on that? And so at a younger age, musicians can start to realize that and have tools to be able to navigate the world. So they, you know, I think I work with, um, I work with a lot of clients who just sort of live in this, well, I should do this. I was always told I could do this, like sort of never really given opportunity to think for themselves. And then you get to a point in your career where you may not be happy or things aren't really aligned or something isn't working. And you realize that you've never actually done what you really wanted to do, you know? So can we have those conversations sooner? You know, can we start bringing in resources um, to show musicians what's possible and show them that it doesn't always have to be like, what's a traditional path anymore, right? What is that? You know, is there such a thing? I'm curious though, is your series beyond the notes? Is that your opportunity to have the conversations that you've wanted to have? You mean, all this experience you've had touring, recording all this stuff, and and all your collaborations. Is this a platform to to host your ideas and the, and the ideas of people you really admire? Beyond the notes, it's an innovative concert series. I wanted to do things uh, in a way that had never been done before. You know, I wanted to shake up the norm of what a concert experience is like. And so for audiences, yeah, I'm I'm doing exactly that. Um, and, you know, Beyond the Notes is centered around really creating a unique experience for the audience. Pre-COVID, I was doing really big shows. I was bringing in guests. Um, and basically, there was an opportunity for audience members to answer questions. Uh, no, not answer questions. They were writing the questions. I was answering them. The performers were answering them. Um, we'd answer the questions live on stage. And it created a different dynamic in the concert hall. You know, it brought down the barrier between the performance and the, the performers and the artists and gave this experience to people that they'd never experienced before in sort of really getting to know the people they're watching on stage beyond just what's in their bio, about where they went to school, what competitions they won, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and now since COVID, it's, it's shifted and I have Beyond the Notes Minis, which is a different format, uh, a COVID safe um, series where um, I'm highlighting the works of black composers, I'm raising money for social justice, and uh, and I'm also doing really eclectic programming. I use my loop pedal a lot. I do a lot of really wild arrangements. Um, on some of our recent shows, I've brought in unique collaborators. Um, for the last show, I brought in Sarah Kenner, who's a culinary coach and a professional violinist. And she talked about creativity and music. And um, I'm always looking for ways to just sort of shake things up and do unique collaborations. Um, so I think what I've been doing is sort of, maybe I'm shattering the norm. I don't know. You know, I'm, I've created something that has not been done in quote, the traditional way. Um, and I'm bringing that experiences to audiences and yeah. 
So you have these kind of not traditional classes to begin with, and then because of the pandemic, you have these this even further reimagined things. What have you learned from these concerts, the mini concerts that is, that you might keep going forward with the bigger audiences? Oh my gosh, I've learned so much. I mean, well, just sort of on a general level, I think it's also, I've realized how much um, people really are hungry for music and the connection. And I mean, I say that sort of, I always knew that, but just the response that I had from, I started doing the shows live outside mm -hmm. um, in the warmer months, socially distanced, and now it's all virtual. But just the community and the connection and the excitement was really, really inspiring. And I think also, you know, I brought in, obviously, I wanted to highlight the works of black composers. I'm addressing social justice issues mm -hmm. by, I choose a different organization for each set of concerts I do and 25% of the proceeds are donated. And I'm having conversations around that. And I think I definitely want to keep that apart. I wanna keep um, that a part of the concert series. I think moving forward, looking, looking ahead, I'm still, I mean, I'm planning on doing a show every other month, I think. It's sort of unraveling as, mm -hmm. as time goes on. But um, I think that people have really liked kind of the added elements that I've been bringing in. I mean, a lot of them have been possible because of the virtual scenario mm -hmm. but um i definitely want to and i think also the small setting has been nice i mean granted in socially distanced shows i could only <laughs> play concerts for about 10 or 12 people so mm -hmm. i did eight shows in a weekend so i'm hoping for slightly bigger than that but um the intimacy of that and uh i think is something that i'm i want to to definitely keep as i figure out you know how things are going to evolve as concert halls start to open up and all of that so going from playing concerts all across the country to going back to your your hometown of Concord, Massachusetts, right? So is there a is there a local feel to it? I mean, you're saying you're partnering with the local organizations, and mm -hmm. is there even is there like a New England feel to it, or what what makes it particularly Concord? You know, Concord is a really unbelievable community because it's a very curious audience. People want to learn. Mm -hmm. People are very curious. They're hungry for new information. Um, it's also a very active community politically, socially, um, like, uh, and so there's a lot of that as well. People are very active and, and excited about being involved in things. So I think, and that's one of the reasons why I've been so successful with the series is that there is this hunger to learn and experience things in a different way. People are just, they like want to know why, how did you do that? Why did you do that? Tell me about this. Where does that composer, like, where did that composer grow up or what, what does that piece mean? Like, they're just like, tell me, tell me, tell me. Um, so I think that that's been, you know, that's, that's the flavor of Concord, I think. So you've talked about the, the concerts itself being interactive. Has any of this, these conversations between you and audience members, has it informed any of the direction that you've taken it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things I realized is that with a lot of the questions people wanted, people were curious about stories. And so I guess sort of I think about, you know, how what I talk about in the shows, how I address my audience. I talk a lot on stage, um, you know, just like Sybarite does. And, and that's definitely informed, you know, the things I'm telling them. Also, I've gotten, you know, people will ask about specific pieces sometimes, you know, feedback, like people want to know um, the history of things too. So that's been really interesting. It's informed how I program things. I saw that you, you've, take, you've taken this outside of Concord. Yeah. So how does that, what translates in other communities and what do you have to amend? There's always eclectic programming. That will always happen. That translates very well. And I think the questions and the answers have translated very well too. I'm not really sure what I have to amend. I think that when I've done it out of Concord, I mean, the experience has been really great. The audience has been very engaged. And it's just, it's something that people haven't experienced at all. You know, like, what do you mean? Like we can write down a question and it might get picked on stage, you know? So I think I haven't really changed mm -hmm. much. So it's a pretty yeah. mobile format then. Yeah, it is a very mobile format. And the beauty of it is that I can collaborate with the local artists wherever I am. So that's sort of, you know, that's my mission is that I can go to the series in, you know, I did something in Vermont and I collaborated with a pianist there and I brought in a cellist. And so um, there is also, you know, the collaboration aspect can be done that way too. Well, Sarah, we hit on many of the, I think the the legs of your your stool here and the I'm curious about what other things you have going on though that I that I missed. 
Well, you know, one of the things I've been working really hard on during COVID is really building my musician's coaching business. And I'm a musician's life and business coach, and I help people um, really unlock what's holding them back from creating the career of their dreams. You know, I help people create more ease, joy, and excitement. And I've been working really hard on building that, which has been really amazing. And I think also during this time, a lot of people are going through transitions. A lot of people are exploring different avenues. It's a time when people are asking a lot of different questions and important questions about their careers and their lifestyles, because I think our career can obviously inform our lifestyle. So, you know, I, I work one on one and I do group programs and I actually have a group program coming up, which I'll be launching. I'll be starting in the end of March. It's called the Career Reboot. And essentially it's four months and it's an experience for musicians to really dive into, um, you know, how to create a career with more joy, ease and excitement and opportunity. And it's a combination of business skills. It's a combination of really mass of learning how to master the things that get in the way. Um, and you know, what I do with my clients is I help them, you know, you figure out where you are now, you assess where you are now, you figure out where you want to be. And I help clients build that bridge um, so that they can actually reach those goals. And where can they find you for that? Yeah, well, you can find me on my website at sarahwhitney.com. Um, I also have a blog called The Productive Musician. Um, you can read about some of the things that I talk about in the coaching world. That's theproductivemusician.com. And you can find me on Instagram at The Productive Musician. And um, yeah, and if anyone's interested, I offer free 30 minute discovery calls for anybody who's interested in learning more about the program or just learning more about my work. Um, I'm happy to talk to anyone who is interested in sort of um, making changes or just wants to explore to see if it's the right fit. I'm curious with this program, how many hours a week kind of commitment is it for a student? Yeah, well, it's mostly, it's, it's all professionals. Yeah, it's all professional musicians. Um, the commitment is from one to three hours a week. You know, there'll be weekly uh, training sessions. There'll be group coaching sessions biweekly. Um, the commitment is not huge, I think, but the beautiful part about the program is, is honestly the community. My goal is, you know, I did this program uh, last spring and this is the second launch of that and just bringing together a community of musicians who are like-minded, who are really are dedicated to creating what they want to create, who are willing to have real conversations about the challenges that we face. Um, and, you know, that's my whole, like, I stand for being real. I stand for being honest, authentic. I don't see any point in sort of, you know, sugarcoating things. I think there are challenges we all endure, but there are also solutions. So what I want to do is create a safe space where musicians can support each other and um, learn from each other. And, you know, obviously I share tools and I provide templates and sort of timelines and different business aspects to help people create the things they want to create. So this sounds amazing. Do you, so you envision that there people are going to be working with you one-on-one -on -one to some degree, but when you say a community, are you going to have like group classes where people can kind of brainstorm and bounce ideas off each other? Yeah, so basically there's a private Facebook community that um, where just the people in the group will have access to, where people can be in contact, share and support, and all the sessions are done on Zoom. So there is a community feel where people get to know each other. Um, you know, there'll be accountability partners, there'll be systems set up so people can really lean on their colleagues, support each other um, in that way. Yeah, so obviously the timing of this is probably pretty fortuitous if we're going to be coming out of the, um, Dr. Fauci says that by the fall, perhaps we could all start gathering together again. And so maybe your, your clients will sign up for this four months down the road, It'd be about the time where we actually can put some of this stuff into practice. Well, you know, I would actually, I hear you, but I think I have a lot of clients that have created things in the meantime. You know, I think it's, I'm really of the thought of, you know, there are obviously things that we can't do now, you know, mm -hmm. live concerts being a challenge, but I have clients that have created online concert series. I have clients that have launched podcasts. I have clients that have created really successful online teaching studios and, you know, been innovative with the way they're creating things. I have clients who have released recordings and videos. And so I think I'm of the school, of, you know, it's not that we have to wait around for our projects to happen. You know, it's that how can we be creative with what we want to create now and adapt to the times? I think being adaptable, being flexible is is something that is always helpful in, you know, our career, in our lives. So I would say that, you know, many of my clients are full on in their projects. Maybe their projects aren't exactly how they envisioned them <laughs> pre-COVID, but I think there's no reason to feel like we have to wait around for things to open up again. Well, this podcast 
began during COVID and perhaps because of it, because I had the time. It's something I had been, I, I wanted to do something like this and learn from my peers around the country. Um, do you think that this, this time during the pandemic has actually unleashed a certain amount of creativity? Yes, I do. As I mentioned earlier, I think it's given people a chance to sort of think about what's important to them. Um, you know, me personally, I think just from my experience with my concert series, I've been doing a lot of arrangements for violin and loop pedal. I've been actually being creative in a way that I hadn't been. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I realized how much that was missing from my career, just me making my own creations. Um, and I know other people that have felt the same, you know, having space and time, or maybe not space and time, but just assessing things in a different way and realizing that maybe their creativity isn't being as nurtured as it could be. Does all this stuff that you see, the interactions you've had with folks in your community, the community you've built online, and sort of the pent up energy that all this has created, does it make you optimistic for the future? Yeah, absolutely. If I'm, you know, I'm absolutely optimistic about the future. I think that it's an incredible time for us to create new things and musicians, if anyone can be creative and innovative, is musicians. So we've got that working for us. <laughs> Well, thank you, Sarah. I think it's a good place to wrap up. I really appreciate your making time for this. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening. The music, as always, is by Craig Wagner, guitarist from Louisville, Kentucky. Our next episode features singer, songwriter, harpist, Michaela Davis from right here in Rochester, New York. So please go ahead and hit subscribe.